Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame induction ceremony honoring our nation's space heroes. Please rise for the presentation of colors, followed by the national anthem performed by Susie Cunningham of Kennedy Space Center's Advanced Planning Office. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome today's Master of Ceremonies, former CNN correspondent and award-winning journalist, Mr. John Zarella. Thank you. Thank you, Boy Scout Troop 481 from Titusville. And Susie, Susie just does a remarkable job every time. Susie, really, just terrific. We love you, Susie. How's everybody doing, good? Good. We have a great crowd. I understand we had to add 150 extra seats in here today. I think it's mostly Duffy's family is what, I'm on, what I was told was here. So, um, and the grandkids and all of that, right? That's, so uh, welcome, everyone. It is so good to be here again as the master of ceremonies. Uh, as two space shuttle heroes are inducted into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, both of our inductees flew aboard this magnificent machine, which is overhead, Space Shuttle Atlantis. And I know many of our other astronauts here have flown on Atlantis as well. There is no better place to host this occasion than right here with Atlantis. And now it is my privilege to introduce to you the attending members of the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Now, astronauts, please stand, turn, and wave when I call your names. Al Warden, you've got that? Stand, turn, and wave. That's three things I know. Okay. <laughs> he logged 143 hours in space as the lunar module pilot on Apollo 13. Later, he helped characterize the space shuttle's flying qualities and performance during descent and landing as commander of one of the two-person crews who piloted the space shuttle approach and landing test flights. Fred Hayes.
Command Module Pilot for Apollo 15 and a nine-year NASA veteran, he logged a 38-minute spacewalk outside the Endeavor Command Module to retrieve film from the panoramic and mapping cameras. He logged 295 hours and 11 minutes in space. Al Warden. He was the lunar module pilot on Apollo 16 mission, the fifth mission to land humans on the moon. He and Commander John Young stayed for 71 hours and 14 minutes on the lunar surface, a record at the time of the flight. He has logged 265 hours in space. Charlie Duke. This astronaut was the science pilot on his first flight, Skylab 3. A decade later, he served as a mission specialist aboard Space Shuttle Columbia on STS-9, the first flight of Space Lab, demonstrating the shuttle's capability for advanced science research in Earth orbit. He has logged more than 1,600 hours in space. Owen Garriott. <laughs> He served as pilot for Skylab 3, during which he worked in orbit for 59 days and spent 11 hours on two spacewalks outside the space station. Later, he commanded the third orbital test flight of Space Shuttle Columbia, STS-3, Jack Lausma. As the command module pilot on the Apollo-Soyuz test project, he was one of the first U.S. astronauts to meet in space with Russian cosmonauts. He went on to command STS-5, the first fully operational shuttle flight, STS-41B, the first landing here at Kennedy Space Center, and STS-35, the first shuttle mission dedicated to astronomy. Vance Brand. This astronaut piloted Columbia in 1981 on STS-1, the very first space shuttle mission. He went on to command three more missions, including STS-7, which conducted the first deployment and retrieval exercise with the shuttle pallet satellite. He later served as director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Bob Crippen. During his 19 years with the astronaut program, he logged more than 386 hours in space and flew on three shuttle missions. He served as pilot during the maiden voyage of Shuttle Challenger aboard STS-6, as commander of STS-51D, and as the commander of STS-51J, the first flight of the space shuttle Atlantis. Carol Bo Bobko. A three spaceflight veteran, he was on the first crew to fly an orbiter in close proximity to a free flying satellite on STS 7. He then commanded STS 51A and later STS 26, which marked the space shuttle's return to flight following the Challenger tragedy. Rick Houck. <laughs> a veteran of four space shuttle missions, he piloted STS 8 the first mission with a night launch and landing. He commanded STS-51G and spent 26 hours in space during STS-32, the longest shuttle mission at the time. He later commanded STS-49, the maiden flight of Space Shuttle Endeavor. Dan Brandenstein. Logging more than 500 hours in space, he piloted STS-9 and later commanded STS-61B and STS-28. He also played a key role in returning the, shuttle to, returning the shuttle to flight following the Challenger tragedy, leading the Space Shuttle Orbiter return to flight team, Brewster Shaw. This astronaut, a veteran of five space shuttle flights, served as pilot for STS-41B, which culminated in the first landing on Kennedy Space Center's runway. He then commanded STS-61C, STS-27, 47, and 71, 
the first space shuttle mission to dock with the Russian space station Mir. Robert Hoot Gibson, a veteran of five space shuttle missions, STS-51D, STS-35, STS-46, 61, and 75. He became the first astronaut to log 1,000 hours on the space shuttle and made NASA's first shuttle contingency spacewalk. He has logged 21 and a half million miles in space. Jeff Hoffman. She's a veteran of three space shuttle missions, including the first two flights of the Space Lab Life Sciences payload that expanded our understanding of space and life sciences. On her third mission, she served as payload commander on STS-58, the second flight of Space Lab, and ultimately logged more than 722 hours in space during her astronaut career. Ray Seddon. A four-time space shuttle veteran, he has logged more than 646 hours in space. He distinguished himself as the pilot of discovery for the shuttle program's return to flight mission following the Challenger tragedy, and as commander of the first Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. Dick Covey. She logged more than 1,200 hours, 50 days in space. She served as mission specialist for STS-61A and STS-32, and payload commander on STS-50 and STS-89. In 1995, she made history aboard Atlantis on STS-71 by docking with the Russian space station Mir. Bonnie Dunbar. A veteran of four space shuttle flights, he piloted STS-61C and STS-31, which deployed the Hubble Space Telescope, then served as commander for STS-45 and STS-60, logging more than 680 hours in space. Today, he serves as NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. She has logged more than 975 hours in space, including more than 21 hours of extravehicular activity. She flew four space shuttle missions, including STS-49, the maiden flight of the space shuttle Endeavour. Kathy Thornton. This six-time space shuttle flyer served as pilot on his first flight, STS-32, and went on to command his next five missions, including the first U.S. flight operations with the Russian Mir space station, and the first exchange of resident crew members on the International Space Station. He has logged nearly 1,600 hours in space. James Weatherby. This astronaut's first flight also was the maiden voyage of Space Shuttle Endeavour. He served as pilot on STS-59 and commanded STS-76, the third shuttle docking with Mir. He has logged more than 704 hours in space. Kevin Chilton. This veteran of four space shuttle flights first served as a mission specialist on STS-55. He then served as pilot on STS-71, the first shuttle docking with Mir. He went on to command two more flights to Mir, STS-84 and STS-91, the final docking of the shuttle Mir program. He has logged more than 932 hours in space. Charlie Precord. He racked up more than 1,600 hours in space on his five space shuttle missions. He commanded the first shuttle docking to the fledgling International Space Station on STS-96 and then led the seven-person STS-100 crew on a mission to install the station's Canada Arm II. Kent Rominger. Ladies and gentlemen, our Hall of Fame astronauts.
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome the Chief Operating Officer of Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Mr. Theron Protzi. Theron? You know, it, John does such an amazing job. And, uh, you know, I always come up here and try to be kind of stiff as a board. So, you know, I thought about playing the whole John Zarella role today. Has anybody ever seen the old lean on the podium and just kind of kick back? He's, he just does an amazing job. Good afternoon and welcome to today's ceremony. We're here to welcome two space shuttle veterans into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame's 15th class of shuttle astronaut inductees. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> Absolutely exciting. To all of you he that are gathered here, and on, on behalf of the 60,000 Delaware North Associates worldwide, including the entire team here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, thank you for being with us. It is our honor to host today's ceremony to welcome NASA astronauts Brian Duffy, Scott Perenzinski into this elite group of space explorers and pioneers. At Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, our goal is to tell the NASA story in the most compelling and immersive way possible. To give everyone of any age the chance to truly understand the challenges, the problem solving, the hard work, and the swell of pride that achievements in space can bring to humankind. Astronauts are such an important part of the NASA story. Through their eyes and their stories, we all have the chance to appreciate spaceflight as an insider. Soon those stories will be brought to life in an entirely new way. The U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame will be a component of the new Heroes and Legends attraction opening later this year. You might have seen it as you walked in today. Through this state-of-the-art technology, guests will have the opportunity to virtually interact with our astronaut inductees and experience the thrills of our space program like never before. Heroes and Legends will feature an omnidirectional 4D experience of Earth and space as astronauts share their stories and adventures. An interactive zone will allow guests to see priceless space artifacts, come alive and exhibits up close, and explore multimedia and interactive features. And of course, the newly designed U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame will round out the experience, leaving guests with a deeper understanding and appreciation for the challenges and accomplishments of the U.S. space program. Just this spring, we also launched Cosmic Quest, a live interaction adventure based on real NASA missions, offering a truly immersive experience. Guests can capture an asteroid, launch a rocket, create a habitat on Mars, and even conduct research on the International Space Station. On April 29th, we also launched the all-new 3D IMAX film, A Beautiful Planet, narrated by Jennifer Lawrence, and this document documentary features spectacular views of Earth captured by astronauts living aboard the space station. And then coming this summer, guests will be able to take a holographic journey on the red planet in Destination Mars. NASA and Microsoft have joined forces to provide this guided tour of Mars using a real imagery from the agency's Curiosity Mars rover and the Microsoft HoloLens Mixed Reality headset. Astronauts, uh, excuse me, astronaut legend Buzz Aldrin serves as the ultimate tour guide as guests set out on the adventure on Martian soil. There's even more innovations coming on the horizon, and we are so excited about the future of the complex. Today's children need to have fun learning about science, technology, engineering, and math in order to become tomorrow's space explorers. That's what every new exhibit or every hands-on experience is all about. I'd like to recognize the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for doing the, such an amazing job, their board of directors, executive director Tammy Sudler, and her staff and volunteers for their contributions to today's outstanding ceremony. It's a true honor to work together with ASF on behalf of Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Thank you for years of dedicated service and the incredible job you have done and will continue to do, honoring our nation's astronauts and helping to pave the next generation road to the stars. Lastly, and most importantly, congratulations to this year's inductees, Brian Duffy and Scott Perenzinski. Thank you so very much. That wasn't bad, Theron. But you know, Jay-Z Media, shameless plug, does offer media training. So if you would like, I'll be glad to uh, do you some coaching on the Zarella format. There you go. <laughs> and now it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Hall of Fame astronaut, 
NASA Administrator and my friend, Charlie Bolden. Okay, it says Bolden speaks for three minutes. That lies. Uh, John, thanks very much for your kind introduction. And I have to say, I'm, I'm quite honored to be here with this great crowd today and to represent KSC Center Director Bob Cabana uh, in welcoming you to the incredible Kennedy Space Center, America's launch pad to the universe. Bob, uh, I think all of you know, would, would be here, except some of you don't know. Uh, he lost his mother this past week and, uh, and returned home to, to be with the family. So uh, I would ask that all of you keep Bob and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, I'd also like to join others in congratulating the scholars. That's actually one of the big reasons we get together on this weekend. So uh, to the astronaut scholars, uh, past, present, and even some futures out there climbing around, uh, congratulations. You know, if, I think if Bob were here, He'd tell you how proud he is of his superb KSC team that's hard at work every day transitioning the Kennedy Space Center to a 21st century multi-user spaceport. From modernization of the critical ground systems, such as a new mobile launcher to support the Space Launch System, or SLS heavy lift rocket, uh, in manufacture today to carry Orion to our, and our astronaut crews to deep space destinations only dreamed of in the past. Then there are the game-changing improvements to Launch Complex 39B with its new all-fiber communications and control systems. Or we can journey into the vastly improved Operations and Checkout, or ONC building, now hosting assembly of the second Orion crew module in preparation for the first flight of the integrated SLS and Orion system for EM-1, or Exploration Mission 1. Or we could go to the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building, being restructured to accommodate SLS booster and core stage stacking. As the host of, commercial, of our commercial partners, we have handed over numerous facilities, such as the new Boeing CST-100 assembly facility, formerly known as OPF, or Orbiter Processing Facility 3, or the SpaceX Falcon Heavy Launch Complex, uh, LC-39A, from where Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins launched on the historic Apollo 11 mission to land on the moon. There are more facilities scheduled for commercial transition and use. Our launch services program, LSP, is now more busy than ever with diverse missions and preparation under their watchful eye. OSIRIS-REx, the Origin Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security and Regolith Explorer. Goals are Geostationary Operational Environment Satellite R-Series and Cygnus. Those are all scheduled before the end of this calendar year and then Joint Polar Satellite System, or JPSS-1, the Ionospheric Connection Explorer, ICON, the Transiting Ex Ex Exoplanet Survey Satellite, TESS, the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite, M, or TDRS-M, and uh, Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite 2, or ISAT-2, all scheduled for 2017, the year in which we are still very hopeful to see the first commercial crew vehicles launched from right here on the Space Coast, returning launch of our crews uh, from America once again. Big deal for us. And then Theron's already mentioned it, but coming later this year, what we think will be the spectacular Heroes and Legends exhibit that will house the Astronaut Hall of Fame and bring even more incredible exhibits uh, for, the, for the public. But to return to the occasion for today, what an honor it is to be able to join my fellow Astronaut Hall of Fame alums to welcome two wonderful, wonderful people, astronauts Brian Duffy and Scott Perzinski into the hall. Brian was on my crew for STS-45. In fact, as my pilot, Brian ran my crew on STS-45. Some of you who know me know how that happens. We were aboard the space shuttle Atlantis, one of four missions that Brian flew on the shuttle. A test pilot by training, Brian had a distinguished career serving in the US Air Force. Thank you for your service, Colonel Duffy. While I never had the opportunity to fly with Scott, I have long admired his work as a veteran of five shuttle missions, seven EVAs, and equally amazing to me, um, just his journey to summit Mount Everest. 
Today, we at NASA are on a journey to Mars that will take American astronauts to, the astro to an asteroid next decade and to the red planet in the 2030s. When our astronauts put the first human footsteps on Mars, they will be walking in the footsteps of Hall of Famers like Brian Duffy and Scott Perzinski. When our children's and grandchildren's children benefit from NASA-driven advances in medicine, technology, earth science, they will have the legacy of Hall of Famers like Brian and Scott to thank. Whenever young Americans stand out in areas like exploration, innovation, and cooperation, they will be standing on the shoulders of Hall of Famers like Brian and Scott. Ralph Waldo Emerson once commented that, and I quote, if the stars should appear but one night every thousand years, how man would marvel and stare, end quote. Of course, the stars come out a little more frequently than just once every thousand years. Their nightly appearances are just a part of life. In a way, the same can be said for all the progress we've made in space exploration. The new heights we've reached, thanks to astronauts like Brian and Scott, have become so ingrained in our culture that we don't always think about just how incredible, how absolutely incredible, all that we have achieved actually is. I like to call the young Americans of today the space generation. President Obama calls them the Mars generation because of the expansive way in which they look at our universe. When I tell my three beautiful granddaughters, for example, that we're going to Mars, they ask me, why stop there? I tell them, let me get to Mars first. The ability to Skype with a friend halfway around the world or watch a movie that's reaching their living room via satellite is just routine for them. Anyone, as a matter of fact, who is age 15, now soon age 16 or younger, has not lived a single day of his or her life. In fact, not one single second of his or her life when human beings from different countries have not been living and working on the International Space Station together 250 miles above our planet. With this in mind, one of the wonderful gifts of this Hall of Fame is that it gives an opportunity to hit the pause button for a moment, to take a step back, take a deep breath for a moment, and reflect on just how far we really have come. So I want to invite all of you, as we celebrate Brian and Scott, to think about just, just, just the monumental and impactful how monumental and impactful those accomplishments of these two great Americans truly are, and what they mean for both our present and our future. Congratulations, Hall of Famers Brian Duffy, and congratulations, Hall of Famer Scott Perezinski. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bolden. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Hall of Fame astronaut and Astronaut Scholarship Foundation Chairman, Dan Brandenstein. Dan? Uh, thank you, John. And uh, good afternoon, to everyone, and thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Brian and Scott into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. As a chairman of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, it gives me great pride to look out across the faces of the, uh, my fellow astronauts and also the guests here today. Back in the 80s, the original Mercury 7 astronauts decided that there should be a place to celebrate astronauts' accomplishments that shares the side of human spaceflight in a unique and personal way. Their dream of the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame came to reality in 1990. And now, look how far we've come since then. You heard Theron talking about the new one going up right across the way here. The Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame seeks to celebrate and inspire more than that, the, the goal of keeping America uh, on the leading edge of technology and innovation. And that means encouraging students to aim high, dream big, and pursue their careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. That's where the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation comes into play. ASF awards merit-based scholarships to the best and brightest students working toward careers in those fields. 
the prodigious, prestigious astronaut scholarship uh, is known nationwide as one of the highest scholarships awarded to undergraduate STEM students. Since its inception, ASF has awarded over $4 million worth of scholarships to over 400 scholars. Now, uh, the last astronaut selection, we were all very excited and thrilled uh, in the foundation because the first astronaut scholar alum, Christina Koch, was selected as a NASA astronaut uh, to be begin uh, the training program. Uh, last night at the gala, she shared some of her early childhood uh, uh, visions and inspirations and also shared with us what receiving the astronaut, uh, astronaut uh, scholarship uh, meant to her and the uh, support and inspiration uh, that the uh, astronauts uh, provided her as she went through her schooling and ultimately the rest of her career that uh, has uh, enabled her to arrive at the scholarship program. Uh, in, uh, in the audience with us today, in fact, uh, there's a relatively large group of uh, astronaut scholar recipients. And uh, so if the scholars would all stand so everybody can recognize them, they're truly amazing individuals that have done What they have done and accomplished is really eye-watering. Uh, we have a technical conference uh, as part of this uh, program this morning, and uh, we went in and sat and listened to these folks uh, tell us what they're working on, and it's truly mind-boggling. In fact, if I had to repeat any of it, I probably couldn't because it, most of it went over my head. But, uh, <laughs> but they really do, uh, do a wonderful thing. Well, uh, <clears throat> Now we can't, uh, we can't get this done alone. Uh, the, we receive a, a lot of support uh, from all the astronauts, from friends of NASA, and also at, from NASA with Charlie Bolden, who you heard earlier, Bob Cabana, who couldn't be with us today, as well as uh, Theron Prossi, who you also heard of, from the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, and that support is invaluable. Uh, and their achievement, uh, I mean, their involvement is uh, truly appreciated. And now before we continue, uh, I want to pay tribute to two astronauts who have passed away since our last induction ceremony. Hall of Fame uh, astronaut, Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell passed away. He was on our board of directors and was a strong supporter of the foundation for many years. Also shuttle astronaut Don Williams, who also had uh, supported us at this event many times uh, during his life. They both had remarkable contributions to the exploration of space and their legacy lives on. Let's take a moment and remember them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Are you ready? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for what we came here for, to begin the induction of the 15th class of space shuttle astronauts into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Our first inductee is Brian Duffy. mission and the retrieval of the Eureka spacecraft. Main gear touchdown. We knew the man would come through. Thank you. 
mission and liftoff of Discovery, making shuttle history and building our future in space. Oh, and here you can see us deploying the boom. We copy. Main gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. Wheel stop, Houston. Happy wheel stop, Brian. Your great landing today made everybody happy. Welcome back to Earth after a super successful mission. Brian, du Brian Duffy was selected as a NASA astronaut in June of 1985. Duffy kicked off his astronaut career as a spaceflight communicator and helped to develop instrumentation displays as well as procedures for shuttle crews to use on later flights. He flew in space for the first time as the pilot on STS-45 aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis, launched March 24, 1992. The flight was the first of the Atlas missions to explore the Sun-Earth connection. A year later, Duffy occupied the pilot's seat again on STS-57, this time aboard Endeavour. The 10-day mission launched June 21, 1993, and marked the first flight of the pressurized SpaceHab science module. In January 1996, he stepped into the role of commander on STS-72, leading the six-person crew of Endeavour. This nine-day flight included two spacewalks to help NASA prepare for assembly of the International Space Station. Next, Duffy commanded shuttle Discovery on October of 2000. That flight, STS-92, saw the installation of the station's first section of backbone, the Z-1 truss, and a series of four spacewalks to configure and activate it. During his four space shuttle missions, Duffy logged more than 40 days in space. Duffy retired from NASA and the United States Air Force in 2001, but he didn't leave the aerospace industry. Today, he is Orbital ATK's Vice President and Program Manager, leading the company's human space exploration activities at the Johnson Space Center and here at Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Brian Duffy. To present Brian Duffy for induction into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Kevin Chilton. Thanks, John. Brian just told me, be nice. <laughs> you know, as you might imagine, we all know too many stories about each other. And uh, my intention is to be today, Brian. Um, let me add my congratulations to Scott. He'll be coming up here soon to join, but this is my one chance to congratulate him in public and, and Brian, you too, of course, for this uh, well-deserved honor. I'd want to also thank the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Center for providing this marvelous venue and support. This is my first time to see Atlantis since I saw her launch on her, her last flight from just outside the doors at uh, Banana Creek. And I'm just blown away by this facility, and it's so nice that we can have this special event here today. And Dan, I want to thank you for your leadership for the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Uh, what, a, what a tremendous, tremendous organization doing great things for young people in, in our country that are going to pay back tenfold the investment we make into them. So thank you for that. Mr. Duffy. Brian Duffy, I don't know if you know this, but he's, he's a, an Irishman from Boston. Not only an Irishman from Boston, an Irishman from South Boston. And if you know the history of Whitey Bulger, I need to say no more. <laughs> to tell you that Brian grew up in a tough neighborhood would be the understatement of the day here today as a Southie. And, uh, you know, he's a working, a working class family, a big family, five children growing up in, in South Boston. And Brian knew his place in the family and worked very hard in school. 
and worked very hard at sport. You know, I grew up in the era when the Red Sox couldn't win a World Series, but my Lakers couldn't beat the Boston Celtics. So it was a, a marvelous time for a young man, a young boy who, who maybe dreamed of playing baseball and basketball and really never dreamed of flying in space. Brian said, you know, I asked him, did you always want to be an astronaut? He said, no, you know, I, if, I thought it was cool, but it's nothing I could ever do, certainly from my, my upbringing and my background. I asked him about joining the Air Force. How did you end up doing that? And he said, well, he had a cousin who went to the Air Force Academy, but at the end of the day, there was a lot of, lot of financial incentive to go to the Air Force Academy and the free education when you come from a family of five in, that, uh, in the neighborhood that Brian grew up in. The prospect of playing baseball was also a good thing as well. And although not recruited, Brian walked on to the varsity baseball team as a freshman at the Air Force Academy and made the team. So here he was in the United States Air Force, studying mathematics, playing baseball, and kind of getting introduced to flight. In fact, his first introduction to flight was on the airline flight from Boston to Colorado Springs to attend the Air Force Academy. So he didn't go there thinking he wanted to be a pilot. He didn't know what that meant. He didn't go there thinking he wanted to be an astronaut. That was something that other people did. His sophomore year, he was offered an opportunity to try out for a professional baseball team. And thankfully, for all of us, he declined the opportunity and elected to stay at the Air Force Academy. What a different career that could have been. He majored in mathematics at the Air Force Academy, not choosing any simple subject to get through. But I think one of the important things that happened there happened on the athletic fields. And in Brian's senior year, he was elected to be captain of the Air Force Academy baseball team. Now, a lot of folks may not think that's too big a deal. I mean, every team has a captain. But when I consider the fact that my classmate, Mark Welsh, was on that team, Mark Welsh is currently a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and is the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, four-star general, being selected to be Mark's captain is a big deal. So Brian's leadership skills, he exemplified early, very early, even as a cadet at the Air Force Academy. He'll tell you he didn't have the best bat or the best arm on the team, but it's clearly he was the best leader on the team. You know, but the singular most important thing that happened to Brian at the Air Force Academy had nothing to do with academics, and it had nothing to do with baseball, and it had nothing to do with falling in love with flying. It had to do with falling in love with Janet Helms this uh, blind date that he got set up on for the ring dance at the Air Force Academy. Now, the ring dance, I'm told by the current cadets, is the second most coveted ticket only behind the Academy Awards in, uh, in the United States of America. Of course, those are Air Force Academy cadets that tell me this, you know, and, and they're trying to get as good a looking date to come to this thing as they possibly can. Jan, this was really, no kidding, a blind date for Jan because they had been set up by a friend, uh, letters had exchanged, Jan had sent Brian a picture. Brian was smart. He did not send Jan a picture. <laughs> he wanted to make sure she got on that airplane. <laughs> and who was the last one off the airplane that day in Den at the Denver airport? Coming off seeing this young man standing there holding her photograph in hand was Jan Helms. Uh, it was instant love. In fact, Jan told me she extended her time on that stay to get to know this young man a little better. And when Brian graduated and had a chance to go to undergraduate pilot training, he didn't try to go to the, the nice uh, spa location that I went to in Phoenix, Arizona. He volunteered to go to Columbus, Mississippi to be close to Jan, who was teaching school then down in Florida. And of course, that led to a wonderful marriage and a wonderful family that I think was appropriately described earlier as taking up a good number of the seats here today. And it's so wonderful to have the Duffy and Helms clan here to be part of this. Brian. Uh, I know he did great in pilot training, he was a distinguished graduate, and in 1975, when he went to pilot training, graduating the next year, the F-15 was the newest, hottest jet in the United States Air Force. And mostly only experienced people were given that airplane, except they picked a few nuggets right out of pilot training who they thought had some potential. And Brian Duffy was one of those very first second lieutenants selected by the United States Air Force to check out in the F-15. Off to Langley Air Force Base he went, and, had a, and did spectacular there, was uh, one of the bright up and coming stars. When out of the blue one day, someone handed him some orders that said, you are gonna go to Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, Japan, and you're gonna be the wing safety officer there. Now, in those days in the Air Force, the wing safety officer was kind of the kiss of death to your career. 
In fact, five guys in front of Brian had turned the assignment down and elected to get out of the Air Force. And the only reason Brian got the assignment is he still had a three-year commitment in the Air Force and he couldn't say no. So, you know, any, just being a logical guy, Brian figured, well, this is it for me. I guess I'll go to Kadena. But while I'm there, I better be thinking about my next career because clearly the Air Force has given up on me. Um, it's where Brian and I met. And Brian became my instructor pilot. Now, I knew none of these stories, and I didn't understand what it meant to be the wing safety officer, but I understood what it meant to be a good fighter pilot, and I knew I had the best fighter pilot in the 18th Tech Fighter Wing as my instructor pilot in Brian Duffy. But I guess to put it in NASA term, being assigned to the 18th Tech Fighter Wing uh, headquarters safety office was kind of like being assigned to Building One at the Johnson Space Center. It was not something you desired to do or looked forward to do. But Duff, you know, is one of these guys that just, he just doesn't complain. He goes through life with a skip in his step and a smile on his face and just does his job, and just does his job better than anybody around him. And apparently he did it better than he even realized because eventually, although he thought it was the end of his career, some th interesting things were happening behind the scenes. Of course, he didn't know it, so he executed his plan. He thought maybe being a test pilot would be kind of interesting duty, so he filled out an application to test pilot school. Uh, he was not selected. He was an alternate, he found out. Well, plan two. Uh, and this is a strange one. I guess I'll go be a lawyer. I don't know, there may have been a connection back to Southie there that I just haven't heard the story about. But you know, here we got a fighter pilot, math major, wants to be a test pilot, and his bailout plan is to be a lawyer? So when he's on a temporary duty trip to the United States of America for two months in Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, he sneaks out one weekend, rents a car, drives to Auburn, takes the LSAT, and gets accepted into two law schools. Comes back to Okinawa. He's two weeks away from dropping his letter to get out of the Air Force saying, thank you very much for a wonderful career. I'm off to law school. When the wing director of operation, an infamous fighter pilot named Moody Souter, calls him into his office and says, Brian, you've done a great job as the uh, head of flight safety here, and I want you to go to fighter weapons school and be our representative for the 18th Tech Fighter Wing. Now, this is the most plum assignment any fighter pilot could get in the United States Air Force. To go to, this is the Navy Top Gun Fighter Weapons School, F-15, young captain. Brian says, well, sir, that's really not in my game plan. <laughs> After being less than unceremoniously thrown out of Moody's office, literally thrown out of Moody's office, Brian went back and thought, what, what is going on here? And fortunately, before that, that his letter hit the desk at the Military Personnel Center, a slot opened up at Air Force Test Pilot School. And he got a cold call that said, how would you like to come out for a five flight eval? He said, I think I'll try that. And so instead of law school, Brian ended up off at, at uh, Air Force Test Pilot School in the year of 1982. Now, of course, how did Brian do at Test Pilot School? distinguished graduates out there, of course, and from there he moved on to Eglin Air Force Base where he excelled as a test pilot. Um, I followed Brian not from Kadena to test pilot school and then I was assigned to Eglin and joined him down there and I can tell you he was working on a very critical and classified program at the time that was very important to our national defense and just doing a bang up job. But I also remember that uh, when he arrived down there NASA was going to have a selection for the, another astronaut class, 1985. And every test pilot in the, in the wing down there was applying to be a NASA astronaut, except one, Brian Duffy. <laughs> because he just went to test pilot school and thought that's what he was supposed to be, is a test pilot, not an astronaut. He got another phone call from another wing DO, this time a little kinder colonel who called him in and said, Brian, I understand you're not applying to, test pilot, or to the NASA program. And Brian said, no, I don't think I'm going to. And he says, I think you should. And this time Brian did follow the advice of his colonel. He literally had filled out his application, finished filling it out on a Friday, and a dear friend of ours, Steve Patati, checked out an F-4 for the weekend, flew to Randolph Air Force Base with Brian's application so that the board would have it on, his de on their desk on Monday morning and the only test pilot from Eglin Air Force Base selected by NASA that year was Brian Duffy. 
So, you know, if, you, if you're not a believer in providence, I, I, you know, there's, there's too many examples in this man's life where some twists and turns have, have, have moved along. But, you know, just because the Air Force recommends you to NASA doesn't mean you're in. You've got to go through the interview process and all that stuff. And there's a, there's a great story from Brian's interview that I think is also kind of captures his sense of humor and a little bit of the steel in his spine. So the story goes, Brian is sitting there at the, at the interview table, and of course the head of the, Johnson, or the flight crew operations is chairing this, and there's different astronauts there and personnel people, and they're going around asking him various questions, and one of the uh, questions that was asked of Brian was uh, where he went to college. Now, of course they know this, it's in the folder, but it's part of the game. And Brian said, well, I went to the academy. And the man at the head of the table, who was a graduate of, the, of Annapolis, said, which academy? Brian smiled and said, the academy. <laughs> well, that gentleman who was sitting at the head of the table sent me a note the other day, and uh, I want to read it to you. It's pretty short. So first, he offers his congratulations to you, Brian, and he says, however, I'm a little concerned, and this is just to point out that there's always one more chance to get even. I'm a little concerned that you are honoring an individual who has acquired a reputation for not paying off his bets. For you see, Brian has yet to pay off for his unwise wager on, an, on Air Force when they played Navy during the 2015 football season. I would also note that it has taken the Astronaut Hall of Fame a long time to honor Brian. The Irish, after all, recognized him for his contributions and his virtues some 26 years ago when they made him the 1990 Grand Marshal of Houston's St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> all the best, George Abbey. <laughs> As, uh, Brian's Ascan years were interrupted as the whole offices were by the tragedy of the Challenger accident. And Brian told me, you know, one of the, the neat things that he got to do and feels very connected to was the ability to participate, even as a, a young new guy, in return to flight. And he found himself in short order assigned to the Huntsville, working on uh, issues associated with the main engines and the solid rocket boosters. And most flattering of all, he said, was to be asked by Rick Houck, who's here today, and Dick Covey, who's here today, to be their family escorts for the return to flight mission. Um, for me, picking a family escort is a very, very personal moment and matter. And um, to, to know that these two gentlemen here thought uh, so highly of, of Brian to do that speaks volumes of Brian Duffy. Well, Brian had some good times too with other additional duties in SAIL and Capcom, but there's also that time in the barrel, as the Navy folks say, and he by and by found himself back in Building One as uh, both the Bubba, no good deed goes unpunished punished there, and the assistant director of the Johnson Space Center and the acting deputy director. I can tell you that no one in the astronaut office wanted these jobs. No one. Again, it was like being assigned to headquarters. And yet Brian saluted smartly and took them on, and I can also tell you every one of us in the astronaut office at the time were so glad that Brian did just that because he brought an element of of sanity, we think, I'd like to think, but also perspective from the astronaut office perspective. And we knew that our voice was always going to be heard through Brian's quiet dialogue in, within the halls of power in Building One. He was the right guy for the job and did it brilliantly. You know, John has given us a great summary of Brian's flight, flight experiences. The videos were fantastic. His first flight, he was tutored by one of the greats, Charlie Bolden, and Brian will, has recognized him already. On 57, he did his first rendezvous with Ron Graby and began to be schooled in that. On 72, he did another rendezvous, but I think something else stands out on that flight. You know, um, it's, it's one thing to fly with one rookie on your crew. In fact, that's kind of entertaining. Um, having two rookies on your crew can be pretty fun, really, because you can play them off against each other. Having three rookies on your crew, I would call challenging. Having five rookies on your first flight as a commander is terrifying. And that's what Brian had. Here he was, his first command flight. He had five rookie astronauts assigned to his flight, and his MS-2 was the only one who had flown before, and he'd only flown once. That's the kind of trust in leadership 
that the NASA leadership had in Brian Duffy in his ability to do that mission, which they, they completed very successfully. I'll tell you, those two rendezvous missions, though, the skills he developed in those flights really got put to the test on his last flight, STS-92. Now, 92 was kind of an unsung flight um, for the International Space Station. You know, when you take up a module that people, you can open the hatch and go inside and there's video down to the ground, that's, that's really palpable for the audiences to see on Earth. Or if you put up a 150-foot solar array that deploys, I mean, that is cool. But you got this little box of a truss with these black disks in it and you can't get inside it and you're, what is this Z1 trust anyway? Well, it's the brain of the International Space Station. It's the nervous system. It's the entire control system that keeps it pointed in the right direction and all the communication systems go through it. So it's an incredibly important element of the station. But Brian was happy that to just, you know, tell people, well, it's a Z1 trust and leave it at that. Proud of his mission, though, and proud of his crew. On his last training uh, simulator before that flight, uh, Brian, they had the opportunity to do one more run through the sim. And Brian asked the, the folks over at Mission Control if they could do one more radar fail rendezvous in the simulator. Now, Mission Control didn't like to do those because with the radar fail, they had no information. So they, it's like watching paint dry for the last 50 minutes of the rendezvous, and the crew had all the data on board and look out the window to do it. But Brian felt that he and the crew needed just a little sharpening in that area. Again, I think he was a little prescient. Because sure enough, on STS-92, during the rendezvous with the International Space Station, carrying the Z-1 truss and PMA-3, two very critical payloads, the radar failed. And Brian had to execute the first ever non-radar rendezvous in the space shuttle program. Well, they were trained, right? They had sharpened their skills just before they went up, right? So no problem. Of course, the ground is seeing nothing because the radar's turned off. But Brian's flying it, and they do their burns, and it's night, and they're coming into the portion of the rendezvous where Brian floats back to the back station on the shuttle flight deck and is looking through the optical sight out the overhead window as the sun rises, expecting to see the space station somewhere in the vicinity of the site. Not only is it nowhere in the vicinity of the site, it's not even in the window. So you imagine you're looking up there going, this isn't how it worked in the simulator. And he told me, he paused for a moment, thinking, where is it? And then someone said, look. And out across the payload bay, bay behind the tail of the shuttle, just above the ohm pod, ohms pods, was the space station. Now, there's no procedures to recover from this position, folks. I mean, there, you don't know exactly where you are at this point or your trajectory. And Brian Duffy, the best BFM pilot, basic fighter maneuver pilot I ever flew with in the F-15, put all of those skills and his mathematic skills and his understanding of orbital mechanics to use at that moment. I said, what'd you do, Brian? He says, I leaned on that translational hand controller like you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> he said, McDivitt may have found the McDivitt quadrant, but I was going to test it one more time. And he thrusted toward this thing. All the ground could see was the fuel going away. That's all they could see. They didn't know where the station was and the shuttle relative to it. They were just watching the gauges go down. But when the rendezvous was complete, it turned out Brian had used exactly the amount of fuel program because the correction he put in put him in a final terminal approach that required no fuel at all to complete the rendezvous. This is the kind of guy that Brian is. And the reason you've never heard that story is because Brian doesn't tell stories about himself. Uh, he's a quiet, unassuming leader who does exceptional at everything that he does. Um, I call him an out of the limelight leader, an out of the limelight person who pursues excellence, an out of the limelight person who does nothing but his duty, which we can never ask, be asked to do more of, and always, always with good humor. He was late to the space business. He didn't know it was his destiny, but he woke up one day and found himself at NASA and he never left the space business. Even after leaving NASA, he stayed actively involved in participating with Lockheed Martin and now Orbital ATK to make sure there is a future for this country in human spaceflight. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, good thing, it's a good thing when good things happen to good people. And a good thing is happening today to Brian Duffy. It's my pleasure to present Colonel Brian Duffy for induction into the Air Force Hall of Fame. Astronaut Hall of Fame.
Wow. Chili, did you make all that stuff up? Um, I've only had about six months to get ready for this today since I found out about uh, from a phone call from Dan um, before Christmas. So I was uh, kind of the nicest Christmas present I could have, could have received, uh, except it came with a, a catch, as all things, things do. And Dan said, well, you can't tell anybody to do this. So, so, so you know, I'm used to, uh, on space missions, you, usually you train for about a year before, before you go fly when you're with your crew. And um, so I haven't had a year to do this. I'm not, not quite as prepared as maybe as I would be six months from now. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Kevin uh, was very kind in how he uh, characterized um, my, my growing up in, in my life. Thank, thank you for doing that, Chili. That, that was great. And I know uh, for those of you that were at the gala last night, we talked a lot more about family there and Kevin and the connection that Kevin and my families have, which is um, very, very strong, and that's something that we value very much, Kevin. So, so, so today is um, it's truly an amazing day for uh, you know a young boy that's growing up, and actually the town that I grew up in is, is called uh, Rockland, Massachusetts, and and it's just outside of Southie. Just out, my folks are from Southie. And to get away from some of the things that Kevin insinuated, um, they actually moved out into the burbs uh, in this little town of, of Rockland, which um, is pretty, uh, it, it's pretty nice place. I'll talk a little bit more ab about it. Um, but growing up in that town uh, was, you know, was, makes this a day that I never would have dreamed could have happened here. So, uh, being here and uh, being introduced by a friend of over 35 years, a, a good friend, um, is, this is a special event in my life and, and Jan's life here. And um, thank you, Kevin, for, um, for being here. Thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, when they asked me who, you'd like to, to in, who would you like to introduce you, uh, it took about a, a min, you know, about a millisecond for me to say Kevin Chilton to do that just because of our friendship and our relationship. Uh, thank you for what you've, what you've done, and thank you for being here. And, and Kathy, I know you're here. Thank you for coming too. So, but most of all, thanks for your friendship. That's, that's what I value the most. So. Uh, this, it's truly a humbling experience uh, to be there. Um, joining my heroes, I'm looking at the, the front row here. These are... These are the folks that, that, as I was growing up, I watched do all of the, all the great things. And, and I kind of dreamed a little bit about what it might be like, but never thought I'd ever, ever have the chance. Um, but joining you is a, is a special treat for me. And, um, and I'm really happy and proud to be joining with um, my, my mate, Scott Perzinski, the fearless astronaut and mount, mountain climber that you'll hear, hear more about here shortly. Uh, so, Scott, I, my, our congratulations to you and to your, your family. So. Um, you know, I, I, want to, um, I want to thank the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation and the Selection Committee for, for uh, sh shining this light on us and, and inviting us to join this incredible, um, this incredible group. It's a, it's a genuine honor, and it's, um, it's beyond a doubt the greatest recognition of my professional career. There, I, can't imagine, I can't imagine a better one. And in this role, I look forward to helping forward the um, STEM activities. You heard, the, heard it mentioned already at least once, the, the advancement of science, technology, um, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And, uh, and I look forward to helping out in that role with joining the other astronauts and supporting the ASF. And I'd like to uh, extend a big thank you also to Tammy and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, uh, her staff that is, uh, has put on not only uh, last night's event, but has taken care of every single detail for us over the, over the weekend, which has, has been absolutely fabulous. I'd like to thank Theron, who's, who's here as well, because uh, as has been mentioned, um, this venue is just awesome. 
Um, what do folks think about it? Do you like this, this here? Uh, so every time I come here, I, I, like to, I go up on the top there and I look, and hi folks up there, good, good to see you. I go up there. Uh, fr from right about there, you can see my window. There, so I always, I always like to go up and look at my window <laughs> there, which, which is where I looked out. The, um, but, but this is an amazing educational event. It's a great place to bring children to. And, um, and for all of the folks that are here that have brought children, thank you for doing that. Because you never know when you bring a child to an educational venue uh, where you might expose them to something that is going to change their, their life forever. There, so thank you for bringing all the all the youngsters, the future generation. Um, and and I, I love the way you tell the story of of space exploration here. Uh, you look you look backwards and you look forward as well, there. And um, th that's an important message, so that when people from all over the world come here to um, to to learn about space, which is what they do, they leave much smarter and much more knowledgeable about it because of the way that you're able to tell our story. Um, thank you for the way you do that. So those of you that, uh, that know me, you heard Kevin talk a little bit about some baseball uh, that I played. You know, um, those of you that know me know that I've been a lifelong um, baseball fan. Uh, growing up, I was either playing it or practicing, you know, I was in a game or practicing for a game, uh, something, that, something I loved. Uh, as a child, I followed the Red Sox very, very carefully. Some summers I actually scored, listen, on, on, on the transistor radio I had, um, actually scored every single game for an entire summer there and keeping track of it all. Um, and when the Red Sox played the Yankees, I really paid attention to it because they're cause just because of the because of the rivalry that's there. So one of, the most one of the most colorful characters to ever play the game was a very famous Yankee catcher named uh, Yogi Berra. And at his 1972 induction speech at the Baseball Hall of Fame, the very first thing he said in his speech was, I guess the first thing I should do is thank everybody who made this day necessary. Yep, we lost Yogi fairly recently, but we're going to keep his quotes around because they'll last forever. Um, so uh, I, I would like to do the same. Um, I would like to, to thank everyone who made this day necessary. Um, you know, without putting any words in Yogi's mouth, I think what he was saying was that we're all shaped by the people who touch us and touch our lives. And um, certainly no one has shaped my life and touched my life more than my beautiful wife of 40 years, Jan. So, so. So, she let me drag her all around the world. You heard Chile did a pretty good career synopsis there, but um, we moved eight times in the first 10 years that we were married, some of it to over, overseas. But, she, you know, she let me chase my dreams to fly F-15s, which was a, a hoot, <laughs> hoot. <laughs> the, um, uh, and then when the opportunity came up to become a, a, a space shuttle astronaut, um, she, she fully supported it. And I told a story last night about how when, when I got the call, um, I called back, uh, called Jan at home and our, and our children at the time, Sean and Shannon, were two and four and they were sitting next to the, they were actually, Jan had them on the counter, and um, the phone rings, and I give her the good news, and she's all excited. She goes, she's animated, and she's going, Daddy's going to be an astronaut, Daddy's going to be an astronaut. And the kids got excited along with her. And then after a couple of cycles of that, Sean goes, what's an astronaut? So, <laughs> Um, but, but with all the support I've gotten, so, so Jan says she, she was happy that I got the chance to again chase, chase a, a dream and, and have it come true. And 
It was, it was just an amazing thing to have the best seat in the house uh, riding on a space shuttle while she had the worst seat in the house standing three miles away uh, on the roof of the launch control center watching us leave town on a thousand feet of fire. So, but thank you, honey. I can't thank you enough. Let's see, Sean and Shannon, I want to thank you as well um, for putting up with my absences when, when we were gone. And um, thanks for giving mom and me the support that you did th throughout the years. When it was kind of funny, we were on the bus driving out here today, and Sean and I were sitting in the back. And he goes, you know, this is kind of different. Says, we're, we're driving out to the Kennedy Space Center on a, on a bus with no threat of a launch slip. <laughs> so um, I wasn't exactly known for going on time every time. In fact, on my last flight, we tried. Um, my pilot is here, by the way. Pam, Pam, how many times did we try? We, we loaded up three times. Yeah. Yeah, so, so any, let's, let's just call it a handful of times that we, that we were trying to go. Uh, it, took, it took long enough that my mother left. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and now she, and Shannon and uh, husband Thomas, and I don't know if they're, where they are, they or if they're right, they're here. I just saw them earlier, but they've given us three beautiful grandchildren um, who are roaming around here. Um, yeah, it's little Scarlett, little Audrey, and 10-month-old Nolan. Um, so nothing more important to me than my family. And, you know, I can't thank you all for the support, and I love you all. So. Um, you know, I feel so blessed to have been born um, when and where I was. Uh, I was born into a, a large and loving family and grew up in what turned out to be a friendly, a child-friendly and generous uh, small town. Uh, my parents are no longer here, but the love and the lessons that they, they taught to um, me, my sisters, Diane and Claire, who are here, over here, my brother Tim, who's here as well, sta oh, standing over there. That, um, the lessons that we learned, um, you, you know, we still have. So while we remember mom and dad for everything they gave us, um, and we're happy for the lessons that they taught us. Um, I learned about hard work and uh, caring for a family by watching my dad work two and sometimes three jobs uh, to provide the best that he could for us. Uh, my older brother, Dan, was a, was a Down syndrome uh, child and adult. And the jobs that my father was working provided Dan with the level of care that the wealthiest families in the country provided to their handicapped children. So we weren't wealthy, but we didn't know it. Um, didn't matter, to tell you the truth, because we were raised in a very loving, uh, environment um, where we didn't need, we had everything we needed, we didn't need anything more than that. Uh, my mom was the, the glue for the family, as a lot of Irish mothers are. Um, she lovingly set down the rules and made sure that we followed them. <laughs> um, she also encouraged us to uh, strive to do our best with our God-given talents and abilities. So that was a lesson that we learned uh, early in life. Um, so thank you, Mom and Dad, for all that you did for us. Uh, Jen's family has been important to us as well, and, and they're, they're, they are here today. Uh, her dad, Jack Helms, and Pat, Jack sitting over here next to my, my brother Tim standing. standing and. Uh, Jack and his wife, Patty, uh, are here. And Jack, I can't thank you enough either. Over the years, you've given me some fabulous advice and counsel. Um, you've helped us a lot. It's, helped, it's paid off. And so thank, thank you very much. And as far as like the golf swing tips go, I, I need a few more. So keep them, keep them coming. My game's falling apart. Um, uh, Jan, Jan's sisters are here as well, Judy 
uh, jo Joni and Jackie, and I don't know where they're sitting, but they're, they're nearby, so um, they're, they're here, they're over here, they're right in front of me. Um, and, and their husbands and friends and family are, are all here as well, and they've been done nothing but supportive to Jan and me and our, our family over the years, and we thank, thank you for that. We love all you guys. Uh, so growing up in that small town of Rockland, Massachusetts was actually uh, a pretty lucky thing, although what it meant was the space program was, was a long way away. It was a thousand miles away. But the best thing that was going on in those days, the early days of the space program, was they covered those missions on television really well. So I was able to watch every launch that I could and, um, and g was very interested in what was going on. But as Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, I never thought I'd be a part of it. Uh, I, I, in fact, I, I clearly remember my first um, experience with space. Is I was a paper boy most of my young, you know, young growing up days, where I delivered daily papers there. And I remember a cold winter day, um, right after sunset. A very, and it was a very clear sky, and I looked up and I saw my first satellite, a polar satellite going from north to south, right from, from where I was standing, it was going from right to left. Big, uh, bright, shiny object that, was, that I knew, I didn't know if it was Russian or American, uh, but I knew it was not an airliner, and I knew it was in space because of the speed at which it was moving. And so that was the first time where seeing space and thinking, well, you can put things in space and do things with it. That was the first time it hit me uh, as, a, as a child to do that. So, so I remember very clearly uh, my first exposure. Uh, another lucky thing about growing up in that town was that the people were really generous. In fact, they went and hired a calculus teacher to come teach the class to three students there at Rockland High School. How many schools would do that nowadays? You know, so they hired a teacher to teach this, a, a course to three students. And I attribute that um, to uh, why I majored in mathematics at the Air Force Academy. And then the, having majored in that, that subject uh, enabled a lot of the other things that happened in my career. So, so if you go from A to Z, um, you know, a good way to attribute that is to, uh, to uh, the people of Rockland, Massachusetts, and the fact that they were willing to to do that. So, I'm I'm very thankful to the to the town that did that in those days. So, the human space program has always been kind of on my radar. I've been watching it. Um, Jan and I, in the summer of uh, 1975, came over to watch the Apollo Soyuz test project launch, and Vance was sitting right here in front of me. And we were on the causeway out here, sitting, sitting there watching, uh, looking across the water at the Saturn vehicle that was on the pad out there. And we were wondering what was going on through your mind there as the, we heard the crew getting loaded in. And, and, and Jan and I talked about, you know, what are they thinking? What are they feeling out there? Well, little did we know that years later, and not many years later, um, uh, Vance and Bev would be good friends of ours, would live in the same neighborhood. Uh, Bev would be Sean's Cub Scout den mother, and, um, and their son Eric would be Sean's good buddy. So it really is a small world. Uh, you know, I, I know that the successes that I was able to experience um, in the shuttle program would not have happened without the, you know, the absolute commitment of tens of thousands of people across the country. Uh, You know, those, those people, some were in D.C. inside the Beltway doing the things that you have to do inside the Beltway to make sure that the workforce has the resources that it needs. Uh, some of the people were in project offices and program offices uh, spread around the country. Uh, some were building, you know, flight hardware for us. Um, some were building payloads for us. Uh, the training crew in Houston was getting both the astronaut crew and the ops team ready to, ready to go. Uh, but at least from my perspective, all of that comes together and came together right here at the Kennedy Space Center. And by spending a lot of time here over the years, uh, I've learned just how proud the KSC workforce was of their orbiter fleet. Also, how much of their lives they dedicated 
to, to those orbiters. And, and as astronauts, we actually felt that when we, when we flew the missions, um, we were just being loaned the orbiters. And um, we were supposed to bring it back in really good shape or else. And, um, so it was, in a way, when they let us go fly the, these beautiful machines, uh, it was rather like a father letting a daughter go on a date. Um, and, you know, over the course of a two-week mission, and I remember Charlie saying, saying okay, we're going to clean this thing up before we bring her home. The, over the course of a two-week mission, the inside of the vehicle with seven people living in it will get a little bit dirty. There is, you know, food particles escape sometimes and they stick to the wall and uh, the occasional drop of a, a drink that has, has escaped from a straw. And then there's every once in a while, there's a, a fruit punch explosion. <laughs> and trying to clean up a big red mess is, uh, uh, takes a lot of towels. But usually on the day before entry, we would, uh, we would grab a wet towel, everybody would take a wall or a ceiling, and we would just wipe that orbiter as clean as we could get it to try to bring it back because um, the KSC folks had given us this perfect, clean, beautiful machine, and we didn't want them to think that we had really trashed it. So. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to thank the, um, the, the astronauts who went before us that, that set, the, set the bar so high for us to, to try to achieve, try to, try to reach it, and my other uh, sh shuttle colleagues uh, for all, of, all they did, for all of their help and teaching and guidance that, uh, you know, you guys all set the, set the standard for us to try to watch and learn from you. So I thank you for doing that. So for me, this is a, a day of thanks to all who've helped me, um, but it's also a promise of what's to come. Uh, I was the child of, a, of what I consider the moon generation. Uh, many of us have and are helping uh, lay the foundation on the trip to Mars that Charlie talked about. When I talk with youngsters, I, I tell them that they are part of the Mars generation. They will see it happen, and if they want, they can be a part of it. Uh, the Orion spacecraft, the vehicle that will carry the humans farther than they've ever gone before, has already had an extremely successful test flight. The second vehicle is being built right now in the Kennedy Space Center, and it will launch in about two years on the, on the sp space launch system. That's going to be the nation's new heavy lift rocket, uh, and it's going to take Orion and astronauts to, uh, to where they've never been before. So we're well down the path to um, continuing human space exploration, and it's all going to happen right, right here at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, to the scholars that are here today and those of the future, um, human space exploration is alive and well, and, and I'd like to tell you, just follow your dreams. Maybe don't go to law school. Um, you know, you're, the scholars, as was, was um, mentioned, are just an incredible talent, an incredibly talented group. Uh, and we're actually very happy to hand the baton to you for you to carry to help make the Mars generation successful. So I guess in wrapping up here, I'd like to use one more yogiism. And um, he, was, he said, the future ain't what it used to be. I agree. Um, things are really looking up for the space program and for our country, and I know the astronaut scholars will be among the leadership team that will take us to Mars. So thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for this great honor. Congratulations, Brian, and welcome to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. I have a question now. You guys down in the front row, you heard what he said, didn't you? He said that he grew up watching and admiring you guys. What were you trying to say? <laughs> say what? What was that? Oh, that you're old. <laughs> okay. 
He didn't say it to those guys and ladies over there, did he? He will. I heard you say that. Our next inductee is Scott Parazinski. Parazinski um, deploying the hand controller for the safer. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Copy that. Great job, Steve. And liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Dr. Scott Parazinski was selected as a NASA astronaut in March 1992 and was qualified as a mission specialist after training. He's a veteran of five space flights and racked up nearly 1,400 hours in space. He spent 47 of those hours working outside the spacecraft during seven spacewalks. Parazinski's first flight was STS-66 aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis. Launched November 3, 1994, the flight included the Atlas III payload to further study the interaction between Earth and the Sun, as well as the Space Lab pallet. He flew aboard Atlantis again on STS-86 in September of 1997. The mission marked the seventh docking with the Russian space station Mir. Parazinski served as the flight engineer on that mission, as well as the navigator during the Mir rendezvous and participated in the first U.S. and Russian spacewalk during a shuttle mission. Next, Parazinski flew on STS-95 in October of 1998 alongside an American icon, John Glenn. As flight engineer, Parazinski operated the shuttle's robotic arm and monitored several life science investigations, including those involving his famous crewmate. He returned to space on STS-100 in April of 2001, this time aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. Parazinski took part in two spacewalks, playing a key role in the configuration of the space station's robotic arm, Canadarm2. On his final shuttle, sh shuttle flight, STS-120, Parazinski ventured outside the shuttle space station complex four times including an ambitious unplanned spacewalk to inspect and repair the station's P-6 solar array. Parazinski retired from NASA in March of 1999, not just to work in private, in private industry, but to pursue other exploration goals. He summited Mount Everest 
in May of 2009 and became the first person to both orbit the world and stand on top of it. Ladies and gentlemen, astronaut Scott Parazinski. To present Scott Parazinski for induction into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, please welcome Hall of Fame astronaut Kent Rominger. Kent. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here today with, with two of my favorite people on the planet uh, on the stage with me. And uh, before I get started, uh, I just want to acknowledge Scott's family that's here. I've gotten to spend some time with him, his mother and father, this weekend. It's been very special. It now helps put things in perspective, kind of on why Scott the way he, he is. And uh, we'll get into that. <laughs> but his beautiful, talented wife, Minnie, and then Luke, uh, the Skywalker, his son, is here as well. And by the way, the last time I saw Luke, well, he was three and a half years old and about this tall. Uh, and today he's, he's taller than Scott. Uh, but uh, I first met Scott in 1992. Uh, we both showed up at NASA, a class of 25 astronaut candidates. And immediately, when you show up in the class, you start looking around, you get to meet people, you make first impressions. And my first impression with Scott was, wow, this guy is driven, capable, hardworking, very intelligent, you know what? He's the all-American golden boy, <laughs> whiz kid. And so the key word there is boy, right? Because although he was 32, he looked like he was half that age, barely a teenager. And so to also know that he was a doctor, and uh, being a Navy fighter pilot, we figure out how to pick on people. I immediately dawned on me. There was a, a TV show in the 80s, Doogie Howser, MD. <laughs> so immediately. Uh, Scott became Doogie Howser, and that, that was kind of, I was very proud of that. Uh, <laughs> especially when it turned out, because he hadn't been around a lot of fighter pilots yet in his career, he didn't know how to take this, being called Doogie Howser. And people started shortening it to Doogie. It was just a little bit easier to say. And the fact he was unsure, and, and I don't think really particularly like it, it stuck. And, uh, yes. and so in our, class, in our class, he became Doogie. Uh, and I mentioned All-American. But if you learn a little bit more about his background, when he was 11, his folks, his father worked for Boeing, decided to travel the world, uh, compliments of Boeing. Uh, so Scott, from the time he was 11 until he came back to the US to go to college, uh, went to school in Dakar, Senegal, Beirut, Lebanon, Athens, Greece, and Tehran, Iran. Uh, and then he came back and got accepted into Stanford. And I'm thinking, now how does that happen? Think about it. You just, middle school through high school, you went to school in all these places. Stanford's kind of tough to get into to begin with, much less coming out of the, the schools halfway around the world that Scott did. Uh, so right away, knew there was something very, very special uh, with Scott. Well, so we came in in 92. The way it works at NASA as an astronaut candidate, you have one full year of generic astronaut training which is actually a lot of fun. You get to know each other, you tour the centers, but you, you get to learn about the space shuttle. You know? So you come out of this year qualified on the space shuttle, and then you're hoping to get assigned to a flight. It takes a year uh, of training before you actually get a fly on that flight. Well, by the time we finished our year of candidacy, Doogie was assigned to space flight. And, and it's no surprise at all that, so in 1994, he flew his first flight, only two years, only one year after we had gotten there as a class. And so, so that is very telling. The other thing you're going to come to lo know and love about Doogie is there is no opportunity, particularly if it's an adventure, that he is going to pass up. Correct. If there is an opportunity, his arm is higher than everybody's, he's at the first of the line, and he is there. Well, in 1993, the International Space Station came along, and we immediately started working with the Russians, the Soviet Mir program, and flying US astronauts long duration on Space Station Mir. Well, guess who's at the front of that line? 
Yes, it was Doogie. Uh, he's at the front of that line, goes over to Russia, spends five months in, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why it took the Russians five months, but they figured out, you know, he's a little too tall. He does not fit in the Soyuz capsule. So he got sent home, and, and I was a little disappointed because now he had another call sign that kind of was sticking more than Doogie. So now he became too tall. And uh, so he came back, and uh, it actually, in my mind, was a real blessing. He came back and flourished, uh, started flying the space shuttle. You saw here from the flights, and, and they mentioned, I don't know if you picked it up, but he flew as the mission specialist to the flight engineer, so very involved with the crew, safely getting the space shuttle into orbit and back home from orbit. Uh, but on STS-100, I had the pleasure of getting to fly with Scott. And one of the roles of the commander, of which I was the commander, is you assign the duties to the crew. And so on my crew, we had three rookies, and so as Chile describes it, hey, there's, there's a handful of work there in the rookies. Uh, but the four I had that had flown uh, were all very experienced, gifted astronauts, uh, of which Scott absolutely was one of those. And as the commander, I decided, well, my three rookies, I need to give them the best experience they can have so that they can bring it back to NASA. Part of that experience is flying on the flight deck. So you have the pilot and the commander take up two of the seats. Those are not for barter. Uh, but then you have the flight engineer and the mission specialist one seat. So I have two seats, three rookies. I go, OK. One of them will be the mission specialist two. The other two rookies will split the other seat. One of them gets to fly it up. The other gets to fly them down. Everybody gets to see what it's like being on the flight deck from the shuttle, except for one. Out of a crew of seven, one is going to get the special job of being on the mid-deck the entire time. And as I thought through it, it was dookie. And I'm thinking, wow. Too tall. How it, too tall, yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Doogie. The, uh, so, so I thought, Doogie, who, by the way, has been a mission specialist, too, on two of his flights, which is a very demanding role. He not only was a flight engineer on previous flights, he did that and did spacewalk. Typically, you don't do that to a crew because the training is intense on both of those, and you'll split those, those duties among other mission specialists. Uh, so I, when I sat down with Scott to say, hey, here's what I've got in mind uh, for you to do on the crew, I was actually kind of worried. Because here, you know, my guess is it was the first time in his life somebody was sitting him down and going, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a bad deal, and even though you're really talented, we're, we're not going to capitalize on your strengths on this. So we sat down. I, I went through my logic with, with Doogie. Here's why we're going to do this. And, uh, and he said, OK. You know, and we left. This was in the afternoon. And the next morning, come back in. And Doogie's in the office. And he said, hey, hey, Rommel. By the way, my nickname's Rommel. Rommel, can we talk about those crew assignments? And I said, sure. And at the time I was saying sure, I was thinking, oh, boy, here we go, right? And uh, we sat down, and he pulled out a couple pieces of paper, these multicolored, faceted printouts that were really thorough. And they had to do with what you do when you first get onto orbit, post-insertion, and then what you do be when you first come home, do orbit prep. Both very, very difficult tasks to do well. Both, if you don't do them right, the whole crew gets behind, and that day becomes a nightmare. Uh, and both very undesirable tasks, right? Nobody wants to lead those missions. But, but Doogie had, had thought about it because he was on the mid-deck both going and coming. He, he approached me and said, hey, look at this. Look at these plans that I can do for us if I run post-insertion and if I run Dior prep. What do you think? And I was, I was elated. I go, I love it. And he said, hey, and by the way, do you think I can be the mid-deck commander? And I said, <laughs> absolutely. So, so here I was afraid that uh, I was going to offend Doogie. No, no, no. He's an opportunist. He says, hey, here's an opportunity for me to A, be a mid-deck commander. Not sure we've had one of those before. And, and, and B, do it really well. Well, I don't know if you're starting to get the picture of the trend here, but, but Scott, he, he does. He wants to do everything. Uh, he's always first in line. He's very adventurous, but he's committed. Right? A lot of people want to do everything, and you know, hey, there's no way they can come close to doing it. Scott, when he tells you he's going to do something, he is 100% committed. He is all in. 
And uh, let's look back in his history to look at, for some examples of this. And, and I'm going back before I knew him. And, and by the way, if you go through his, his bio, online bios, what, everything he's done, it's exhausting. I, I get exhausted just reading through this going, wow, right? Because I know him and I know how much energy he puts into everything. Uh, but he was a Rhodes Scholars finalist. He received academic awards in every school he was ever in. And the, by the way, those schools include Stanford, Harvard uh, Medical Schools. He's a pilot. You know, I'm a professional pilot, but you know, not do, he decided he was going to be a pilot. So not just a private pilot, commercial pilot, instrument rated pilot, multi-engine pilot, seaplane rated pilot. Uh, yeah, so you're, you're getting the picture here. Scuba diver. So he wanted to scuba dive from the time he was young. This is one area where his parents held him back. I believe, were you in Dakar at the time? Yes. And the, the bay in Dakar is not very clean water. As a matter of fact, that is, that's code for the sewer uh, in that part of the world. And so he was, you know, pestering his folks, hey, please let me scuba dive. And they're like, no, we're not letting you spend that much time in that water. That is not safe. Uh, but later they found themselves in Athens. So he makes another run on his folks. Please, please, please. You know, he found this scuba diving course. That's the good news. The bad news is it was like two hours away. Logistically a nightmare for his folks to figure out how to get him, who, who wasn't of driving age yet, to and from there to scuba dive. Uh, and so his mother said, well, Scott, I tell you what. If you can find three other friends and their parents agree to share in the logistics, so we split this up on how we get you to your scuba diving class and get you back then okay. He shot out the door. That afternoon, he showed back up with three guys standing there saying, yes, we'll do it. Our parents will do it. Two of the students his parents had never seen before. They weren't sure Scott had either. Uh, <laughs> but yes, very innovative and driven when he wants to accomplish something. Uh, there are many Eagle Scouts uh, in the Astronaut Corps, which is a very impressive thing. Uh, but I don't know how many have gotten the Outstanding Eagle Award, but you're looking at one here. Another thing that's pretty cool about Scott is he's a top 10 competitor in the 1988 U.S. Olympic Luge Trials. And you're thinking, wow, top 10 in the world Olympian. And uh, now keep in mind, he's going to school in Stanford, and I'm trying to think, there aren't that many luge tracks that close to uh, Palo Alto, California. So in figuring out how to make this work, Scott figured out, you know, I'm just gonna have to take winter semester off, find a track somewhere to practice my luge. Turns out those happen to be in Europe, uh, then Yugoslavia and Germany, I believe, are the tracks, uh, to, to follow that passion and endeavor and, and wind up being world class. Uh, as well as you might imagine, he, he's won multiple awards and medals from NASA. Uh, for his stellar performance that he's always done on his flights, uh, including the space shuttle missions and the EVAs, including the one unplanned EVA that was very risky to repair a sol uh, torn solar array. And you have to be really careful with the, the amount of voltage and wattage amperage that are in those arrays. If you do the wrong thing, it's a bad day. And bad day is code for uh, you, you're not going to be around anymore. Uh, so as we look at Doogie Hauser, too tall, Scott Perzinski here. How would we classify him? Thrill seeker? Well, you know, I've always done a lot of thrilling things. Probably not. There, there are some that are adrenaline junkies. Unfortunately, I fall into that category that would maybe be closer to that. But, but thrill seeker? No, I would not classify Scott as a thrill seeker. Risk taker? Well, he, he has done a lot of risky things. But he's not really a risk taker. He, he mitigates those risks and plans them thoroughly and executes them so they're no more risky than absolutely possible. Adventure seeker? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're number one. I've never seen a, a, a more vigorous adventure seeker than Scott Perzinski. And so when I look at him, amongst all the astronauts I've been around, he truly represents an explorer. Space explorer, yes, he, he's done a lot of that with his five missions. Mountaineering, we, we've heard something about mountaineering. The other thing that I'm sure is not a coincidence, 
uh, when he did his residency, he wound up doing it in Colorado at University Hospital. I think the fact there are 59, 14,000 foot peaks, mountains in the state of Colorado had something to do, that, to do with that. He set his goal on climbing every one of them. He did. Uh, that's impressive. Mount Everest, I mean, I'm so proud when I talk about Scott, when I'm talking about our mission, you know, he is the only human on the planet that's done both, as John articulately says, has seen the world from orbit and stood on top of it. Uh, but it doesn't end there. He, he does, he's spent time in Antarctica. He's applied his medical skills there. He's been to the South Pole. And interestingly, this week, this had nothing to do with this event coming up. I'm going through my news on my computer, and here something pops up, Project Poseidon, record-breaking 100-day undersea expedition. Guess who's one of their aquanauts? <laughs> Scott Perzinski. So, so you name it, he's been a lot closer to volcanoes than, than I ever want to be. Uh, he is absolutely an explorer. And, uh, but, but one of the things that I'm most impressed with, with Scott, is he applies himself. But even Scott realizes, hey, there are so, only so many hours in the day. Even Scott, the ultimate Energizer Bunny, only has so much energy. So he actually is fairly calculating on how he's going to apply, uh, apply himself. And we've heard a lot about the great accomplishments. What you haven't heard about is, he does phenomenal things. Uh, you know, one of the things he does, and I'm looking at this forever remembered, if you get a chance, it's a, a phenomenal display uh, to honor our Challenger crew and our Columbia crew. Scott has been very, very involved in both those crews after the fact. Uh, and one of those areas was on STS-107, after we lost that crew of Columbia, and obviously Columbia, because of his mountaineering skills, Scott was instrumental in getting a peak. Uh, one of the 14,000 footers, Kit Carson, has two sub peaks. One was already named Challenger Point in honor of the Challenger crew. Scott worked to get the other sub peak uh, designated Columbia Point uh, for this. Not only did he do that, did everything, got it benchmarked. He arranged and organized, orchestrated getting the families, all the families to Columbia, and in addition, we had a four F-16 flyby to commemorate that dedication. And so he put a huge amount of work and energy into something that he believed in. And, and thank you, Scott, the, uh, that, that was huge. I mentioned Challenger. This is another area where Scott Perzinski obviously decided, you know, this is an area where maybe I can help. He was asked to be on the Challenger Center Board of Directors, and as most enterprises go through cycles, ups and downs, Challenger, by the way, is a phenomenal organization. It was started only three months after we lost Space Shuttle Challenger and her crew, uh, and June Scobie, now June Scobie Rogers, started that organization. It's phenomenal. There are over 40 Challenger Centers around the nation. Three of them are international, and they're growing. But a half a dozen years ago, we weren't growing in Challenger Center. A couple of key board members stepped up and turned that around. One was Bill Reedy, but the other one, very instrumental, was Scott Perzinski. Scott became the, became the chairman of the board and put a huge amount of energy. It was almost a full-time job to wind up turning around Challenger Center, and we all benefit today because that organization is very healthy and on the right upward ramp. And uh, Scott, thank you for that. Uh, you know, when you stand up here, you always try to tell stories that are funny. Typically, that's code for something embarrassing uh, for the astronaut sitting up here. And, uh, so I started thinking about it, and, and uh, I'm stumped. So I reached out to a friend of ours that Scott and I flew with on STS-100, Jeff Ashbury, a uh, fun guy. And uh, so uh, call sign Bones. I said, Bones, do you have any dirt? I'm too tall, or should I call you Doogie? I forget which one you like. Call me Doogie. Okay. okay. And uh, Ashby goes, well, you know, I, he goes, I actually do talk about too tall in some of my presentations. And Jeff said, I, I went to a school, uh, middle school, talked to the students, and before I went, the teacher tasked the students 
okay, student, your job is, when, on the day Jeff comes to speak to you about his astronaut career, you write down what it is you most are looking forward to learning from astronaut Captain Jeff Ashby uh, about flying in space. One of the students wrote, nothing, because I'm a pen pal with astronaut Dr. Scott Perzinski. <laughs> You know, I can go on and on with stories. Uh, in true Perzinski style, uh, one last story is my mother was sick, uh, and uh, she'd had a grand mal seizure. And, and coming out of the seizure, she was confused. She didn't even recognize me. It was shortly after one of my flights. I grew up in rural Colorado. I, I get in there quick, and, and mom doesn't hardly know who I am. And the, it's a very small town, 1,400 people. I'm talking to the doctor, and I uh, said, well, shouldn't we try to get my mother to, to Denver, to the hospitals where we can run more tests? And the doc's like, no, it, you know, it's okay. She's improving. We drew some blood. I'm thinking, well, this doesn't sound right. I call, I call Scott. I say, hey, Scott, here's what's going on. What do you think? He says, do you have that doctor's phone number? I said, I do. And uh, by the way, I'd been pushing on this doc several different times where I, I felt like I'm sure he thought I was being pretty obnoxious, right? I was even throwing the astronaut card down. Hey, I'm an astronaut, you know, to, to, no, to no avail. I give Scott the phone call, and I'm sitting in the room. Man, all of a sudden, it was like a code blue in the hospital. People come running in. They go, hey, your mother's being life flighted out of here. You to get this. We got to get her to the airport. And I was like, wow, right? The doctor, for me, wouldn't do anything. Whatever it is uh, Scott did, thank you. And... Uh, I don't know that we really needed a life flighter uh, to, to Denver. <laughs> so, but by the time she got there, she was actually back to being pretty coherent, knew who I was. You know. <laughs> but by God, we got her there. So, uh, no, you know what? The, it really is an honor for me today uh, to be on the stage with both these guys. Brian Duffy, too, one of my favorite guys. And uh, Chile mentioned it, but there, there was no secret. Duff is an extremely gifted fighter pilot. Uh, I did tell you a little bit of a story, though. Kevin Chilton kind of set the standard here. You know, when we launch from Florida, they want you to come back to Florida unless they're going to rework the vehicle. But in, in Chile's case, he launched from Florida. He didn't come back to Florida, right? He diverted into to California. It's kind of where the Air Force Test Pilot School is. I always wondered. But then we went, we went from STS-76 to STS-92, you know, years without messing that up. I happened to be doing, flying the landing weather at Edwards when STS-92 was up. Duff followed suit. He was the only one other than Chile from STS-76 to 92 that messed that up. He couldn't come back into Florida. He went back into to California. But, uh, but actually, I am really honored uh, to be on stage with both you guys. This is really good. Uh, you know, in, in summary, talking about Scott, extremely capable, intelligent, driven, caring. He, he's a very caring individual. But, but he is truly an explorer at heart. He's trying to do his part to make this planet a better place for all of us. And I can't think of anyone more deserving than Dr. Scott Doogie Hauser, too tall, Perzinski, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Wow, this is uh, certainly one of the most exciting and proudest days of my life. And, and I'm just so thrilled to have so many of you close friends and, and co-workers uh, from the many chapters of my life here to share in this extraordinary day. And it was really fantastic uh, to be on stage here with Brian, who's been a, a close friend, but, but also kind of a, a role model. He's, he's one of those exceptional leaders that, that everyone in the office looked up to, and so it was really exciting for me to get the, the nod with Brian. 
Um, and and like, uh, like you started out saying, uh, it was really the most incredible call of my life, I think, to get that uh, you know, surprise call on Christmas Eve and be told that I was gonna be here uh, for this great induction. So um, wonderful to be part of uh, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation family and to be inducted with all these great legends. Uh, and I, I just have to say, Rommel, that was, you know, you, 95 percent of what you said there, you really tugged at my heartstrings. I'm going to get back to that last 5 percent in here in just a minute, but, uh, um, you know, you, you've been a very good friend for the whole, you know, from, from almost day one, you know, we really clicked as a, as a class and, and as personal friends. Um, you were a classmate, a friend, um, you were my fearless commander on STS-100, and I was part of his very fearful crew. Um, <laughs> and we, I, the stories that I could tell about Rommel, I mean, we'd be here well into the evening, and I wouldn't even have to embellish very much to make them sound unbelievable, and you know that's right. Um, but I, I think what I admire the most about Rommel is his leadership. I think he's the most extraordinary leader that I have ever known, and I've, I've taken so many lessons into my own personal life and, and my leadership style just watching his, his grace and, and uh, uh, command under, under pressure. Um, he was the chief of the astronaut office during our darkest hours, during the, the aftermath of uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy. And our whole agency, our whole nation, the whole world needed to, to heal. And his, his steady hand, the, the way he, he managed expectations, his resolve, um, you know, really carried, carried all of us forward. Uh, I was a... Uh, uh, a family escort and a, uh, a casualty, uh, uh, basically an escort for the, uh, the, my good friend Rick Husband in the aftermath of that terrible tragedy. And, and uh, they, they were very difficult days for all of us. Uh, but I think it galvanized the whole agency to figure out what had happened and make sure that it could never happen again. Uh, but oh, by the way, since it's NASA, we have to develop tools and techniques to make sure that if it did happen, just in case, we would have a fighting chance to, to do that. And so um, I was part of uh, uh, a team to help develop tools and techniques to uh, repair shuttles on orbit and help us have a fighting chance to come home and should that ever happen in the future. But um, there are so many uh, wonderful stories of, of how people came together in that very trying time. But I don't want to have my, all my commentary uh, be on that note, and so I, I want to get uh, uh, back to that 5%. And let's, let's talk about Doogie for a little bit, okay? So, uh, <laughs> first of all, there's so many emotions that flood through you as you stand here on a day like today. Uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm standing in front of uh, men and women who have been my inspiration you know, since I was a little kid. And I'm looking at you young shuttle folks too, okay, just so you know that. Um, but uh, um, it was, uh, it was a, a really interesting time when I first arrived at NASA. I think Rommel was a little bit generous in terms of my appearance when I first got here. I think I actually looked about 12 when I first arrived at NASA, but only if I hadn't shaved for like three weeks. If I was clean shaven, I was a six foot three kindergartner. So this, this is really what I was dealing with. And, uh, and so I could only imagine the, the conversations in the corner office where Dan sat at the time where they're making those coveted flight crew assignments. Hey, what do you think about that Perezinski kid? You know, he seems, he seems pretty sharp. Nah, stick him back in the incubator. That, that was my, uh, my the imaginary voices in my head, uh, uh, thinking that uh, you know, there's no way that they're gonna take me seriously, give me a flight assignment. But it actually turned out to be quite a great motivator for me to be as well prepared as I could possibly be uh, uh, going into my simulations. And it, things turned out okay for me, I guess. But, um, in any event, uh, my very clever classmate, Rommel, came up with the name, yes, Doogie Howser, MD, after Neil Patrick Harris's character on this, the like-named uh, TV show, or NPH from Harold and Kumar. Any Harold and Kumar fans here? Two of you, that's it? Oh, come on, that's, need to get out more. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, it was really interesting when folks would, uh, you know, come up to greet me, they'd say, hey, Doogie, how's it going, man? And it, there was a, like a three-second delay, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. What? <laughs> that was very loud, sorry. Uh, and uh, so as you might imagine, I, I didn't disguise my disdain for this call sign very well, and it immediately stuck. And so this is a, this is a, a teaching moment. There are a lot of young people here, a lot of future astronauts are astronaut scholars. Uh, I hope we'll, we'll follow in the footsteps of Christina uh, uh, Koch, who, who spoke beautifully last night, but um, 
what you need to do if you suddenly find yourself plunked down in the middle of a military aviation squadron, which is basically the astronaut office, what you need to do when they give you that first call sign, which I guarantee you'll hate, is pretend that you love it. Put it on your business card. Put it on the sign outside your door. Refer to yourself in the third person as the Dukester. Whatever it takes <laughs> to make sure that people understand that you want that on your tombstone. And if you do that, I guarantee you'll get another call sign. Okay. So, <laughs> in any event, um, for, no, for those of you who know me very well, and I have a huge gathering of folks here. I mean, it's amazing. People from all over the world have converged on the Kennedy Space Center here, and it, it means the world to me to have, have you here. Family, friends, coworkers. I have uh, many, many crewmates uh, that I'm going to brag about, uh, and, and flight controllers that I'm going to brag about, NBL divers that I'm going to brag about that are here uh, and or are here in spirit. And, uh, and so for those of you who know me really, really well, um, you know that I, I actively seek to avoid uh, the spotlight. I would much rather talk about you. Um, I can talk your ears off about my kids. Uh, technology, politics, the weather. I'll even talk about the Kardashians, uh, you know, what, what, whatever it takes. But I, I recognize that here and now today, the spotlight is, is beating down on my good friend and very deserving uh, friend, uh, Brian Duffy's highly reflective forehead, and also mine. Uh, sorry. Um, and so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. I had a shot and I had to take it. So, um, But I'm so deeply honored uh, and humbled to be here today, just standing, standing in front of you, uh, to receive this great recognition not as an individual, but on behalf of literally the thousands of people. <clears throat> Sorry. Getting choked up. Um, but literally the thousands of people who have touched my, my professional career. Um, brilliant, resourceful, creative, passionate people. Professionals, uh, NASA contractor, women and men, American and international partner, who prepared our spacecraft, prepared our, our payloads, trained us for audacious missions up into space, launched us here from the Kennedy Space Center, operated those missions, led those missions from the Mission Control Center in Houston, and then safely brought us back to planet Earth. And uh, you know, what, what an incredible, uh, charmed life I've, I've lived, to have this opportunity to, to live out my boyhood dreams. Um, it's, it's really quite extraordinary to, to be an American, to uh, be able to uh, grow up in an, in an environment where uh, your country dreams big, but then has the resolve to, to fulfill those, those challenges. And I, I like uh, Brian and others have said, I think the future is, is indeed extremely bright. And uh, you know, for the young people, our, your future in space is, is extraordinary as well. Um, so uh, you know, I've, I've worked with so many extraordinary people, uh, flight directors, many fellow crew members are here, here today. Uh, including members of the Hall of Fame, but I have uh, my uh, commander for my last mission, Pam Malroy, in the back, a wonderful leader, and she trained underneath uh, none other than Brian Duffy, and the, the skill set passed directly to you. It was amazing, and I understand it. Your skill set transitioned from Charlie Bolden, so there's the, there's the lineage. Um, Dan Tani was uh, uh, on our crew as well. Um, did a spacewalk with him on my last flight, the STS-120, and he was our robotics guru along with Stephanie Wilson. And then my very good friend, uh, one of my best friends in the known universe, Doug Wheelock is here. And uh, you know, I just think the, the world of him, and I'm going to brag about these guys a little bit long, later in my commentary. And, uh, and then we have Dina Contella, who is uh, uh, our lead EVA flight controller. She's in the back. She's hiding, but I'm going to have her stand up later. She's very shy. Not really, but... Um, but I'm going to brag about her as well. And uh, I think I have some of my NBL dive team buddies here uh, who, in all the spacewalks that I did, I did seven trips outside. I always felt like they were right over my shoulder, uh, there to help me, help, to help guide me, um, coax that last bolt in, hand me the tool that I'm going to need next, make me think through the next procedure. And, and so uh, I want to salute those guys uh, especially. Um, I, I think I, I need to embarrass my home team who are right over here in the third row. Uh, and I'll start with my folks because uh, they're my dad is uh, at, at the edge there and my mom, uh, Ed and Linda Parazinski. I embarrassed them a little bit last night. Uh, we're at the Saturn V Center. It was really a poignant place to, to talk about the impact that 
they had in my life. They're very adventurous folks as well. You know, it didn't fall from, you know, far from the tree, but uh, um, they traveled extensively even before I was born. I think I took my first flight when my mom was six months pregnant. They went to South America. And so I, I actually logged some hours uh, um, even before uh, uh, being born. But, uh, you know, had, had a travel bug and uh, a sense of curiosity about the world and, and never any hard limits on what I could try and challenge myself. Uh, they might have asked questions and, and uh, um, tried to steer me in other uh, more safe uh, uh, directions, but they never held me back. And, and so I certainly attribute a lot of what uh, became of my life to my, my wonderful parents. Um, and so underneath the, uh, the Saturn V last night, it was really, really kind of neat. So this is the largest rocket ever built uh, up to this point. And, uh, you know, at the very tail end of that ship are five F-1 engines that propelled that Saturn V stack off to the moon. And uh, my dad was an engineer on the program and uh, did a lot of work in the design and test of that vehicle. So it was really, really special to be there. My son Luke is here as well. And uh, I, I try not to embarrass him. I, it's pretty easy to do, but uh, he's, he's a fantastic kid. He's, uh, he just finished his freshman year at Baylor. Um, a real scholar, but he's also very social. He's a, a wonderful, empathetic person. He's a great big brother to his sister, Jenna. And uh, can't think, you know, can't say, uh, you know, enough wonderful things about the, the young man that he's becoming. So I love you. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I did not bring my, my younger daughter, Jenna, with me. She's 16, but uh, she is autistic. And uh, quite honestly, you guys are a little bit too rowdy. I think uh, the noise in this room, this cavernous room, would be a little bit distracting to her. But uh, she stayed home. Uh, uh, but she's uh, certainly the apple of my eye. And uh, you know, a wonderful um, gift in our, in our lives. And then finally, uh, the love of my life, uh, Mina Mini Wadwa is with me here today. Uh, she's you know, breathtakingly beautiful, she's, uh, she's brilliant, she's uh, uh, one of the world's leaders in her field, um, but she's also just the, the most uh, wonderful, loving, passionate person I've ever met, and uh, you know, I, I can't imagine you know, going through this life with, without, without many with me. So, um. <clears throat> So uh, as I was starting to say a little bit earlier, I was, I was very fortunate to work with some of the world's best and brightest on my, my five spatial emissions. And I wish I could brag on every single one of the people that I worked with, but obviously we don't have time to do that here today. But space exploration is very much a, a team sport and NASA is, is a champion. It's just remarkable what, what this organization does and, and I feel so gifted to have been a part of the grander vision. The common denominator at NASA in my uh, my mind is a shared sense of a higher purpose, you know, working to explore for the betterment of humanity. So uh, I'll just very briefly talk uh, about some of my flight history, but I, I was very lucky to fly with Ellen Ochoa, who I believe is some, some there's Ellen here. Yeah, so on my first flight, I flew with uh, uh, two rookies. We had three rookies uh, on, on that uh, lucky flight, uh, STS-66, and actually Ellen was my, my mentor on that flight. She was the veteran, uh, astronaut mission specialist who had done a similar flight uh, um, on her first mission and uh, I continue to learn from her today. She's just an amazing person. Um, when I got back from that flight, you know, it was such an overwhelming, exciting experience. The first thing I wanted to do is, you know, get back in line and go again. And, uh, and so uh, they were actually looking for volunteers to go to the Russian space station Mir. And there didn't seem to be all that many volunteers for poor Hoot. And uh, so I went over to the Hoots office and uh, said, hey, coach, you know, put me in. And uh, he was very excited to, uh, to get me in training uh, uh, for a couple of reasons, I think. Um, one is because I'm a big goon. And uh, so being a big goon, I was sort of a test case for what we could fit into the Soyuz capsule in the future. We needed to, we needed to use that spacecraft to evacuate the International Space Station once we started to build it uh, in a few years hence. And so... I was sort of a test case, and uh, as Rommel talked about, I, I turned out to fail that test, uh, and I got a better call sign to Tal Perezinski, which I, I still try and hold on to, but you know what's interesting now, Rommel? I actually really like people calling me Doogie right now. You know, I can't pull it off quite as well. I got a little bit of gray going on here, but it's still, every once in a while, people do come up to me and call me Doogie, and you can call me Doogie if you'd like, anytime. 
Um, but in any event, I uh, um, ended up uh, returning to, to planet Earth uh, um, after a, a great mission on STS-86 with Wex. Wex is my commander and uh, did a, uh, an incredible five-day dock mission to the Russian space station Mir. I went out with one of the, the most experienced cosmonauts in the world, Volodya Titov. He was the very first human to spend a consecutive year off of the planet. And I got a chance to, to lead a spacewalk with him uh, on his space station, which I thought was, was really extraordinary. Um, soon after landing, actually, I, were at a, I was at a Monday morning meeting, I think, and uh, the head of the office, I think it was Ken Cockrell, Taco at the time, he said, uh, hey, Doogie, no, I think he might have called me Too Tall um, at that point, uh, hey, hey, Too Tall, can you stop by my office after the meeting? And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. You know, I just landed from SDA 86 a couple of months ago, or thereabouts, and I'm getting called into the principal's office. Not a good sign. You know, I, th I was thinking to myself, okay, what did I do now? Uh, but uh, as I walked in, he said, hey, uh, how'd you like to go fly with Senator John Glenn? And my jaw dropped, you know, thinking, my God, I'm going to get a chance to fly with my boyhood hero. And it was such an extraordinary experience to, to fly with not just a legend, but a great human being. And to get to know his wife, Annie, and, and the rest of his family, um, what an extraordinary life experience. And I, I just one story from that time, but uh, um, I remember when he walked into our crew office the very first day, he said, if any of you guys even think about calling me Senator Glenn, I'm going to ignore you. I'm just payload specialist number two, or you can call me John, but nothing else. And he insisted on just being one of the guys, even though we were you know, obviously in reverence uh, to him. It was sort of a, uh, what we would call a high pucker factor assignment for me because, you know, I was the, the, the flight surgeon, the, the, the guy responsible for taking care of John on the flight, and if something happened to 77-year-old American hero legend John Glenn, I might as well not come back home. So, but things went great. He was in super shape, and we had a, a, an amazing mission. Then I got to fly with Rommel here, and my buddy Chris Hadfield and Jeff Ashby, and we, we just had a a great, great crew, um, great camaraderie, uh, jokes all the time, but when it really counted, we got the work done. And uh, I told a story, a uh, uh, fun story last night from that mission, but um, our, our lives changed forever with the loss of our Columbia crew on STS-107, of course. Uh, Rick, Willie, Dave, Kulpna, Mike, Laurel, and Elon. I can't ever you know, forget their, their brave sacrifice. And we can't ever take, uh, take space flight for granted. You know, it's, it's it still takes a lot of force to get to break the surly bonds of Earth and to get up into space. So even though we're at this new forefront of uh, commercial space flight and we're going to see you know, greater frequency of space flight operations, we, we can't ever let our guard down. This is an industry that does not allow for any, any error. Um, so at that point, uh, I honestly, uh, when we lost the crew, I honestly considered hanging up my spacesuit. You know, I had uh, two wonderful kids at home and I didn't know if it was right for me to continue uh, taking those risks, but being as close as I was to that crew and with the, the energy that was building around the agency, it was just uh, NASA's at, at, at its finest. Uh, the, the whole agency came together to, to develop methods and, and procedures to get us back to flight as quickly as we could, and I, I had the great opportunity to fly one more time. But I would just say that you know when, when the chips are, town, are down, NASA rises to the occasion. And, um, and uh, soon uh, uh, thereafter, I was assigned to what I would consider my, my most amazing uh, flight experience, uh, and uh, just an extraordinary crew led by PAMBO, STS-120. And uh, it was an extremely complex space station assembly flight. We had to install a new module called Harmony. It was an interconnecting node that had these different serial radial ports that would allow us to plug in um, European and Japanese modules. And then we had to relocate this P6 uh, truss, a solar array truss from the top of the space station, and plug it in at the very tip of the space station using uh, robotics and lots and lots of spacewalking, and then extend these solar panels so that we could power those European and Japanese modules in the future. And uh, it was really a, a spacewalker's dream to be assigned to that flight and also to be on our crew. We had a wonderful crew led by Pambo, but George Zamko was our, our pilot, uh, Zambo, Pambo and Zambo, so we became the Rambonauts, uh, of course, and I became Longbow. I got another call sign out of that, that mix, which is great. Uh, Wheels got uh, a Flambeau, uh, 
because of his pyrotechnic skills. Uh, and then we had uh, uh, Dan Tani, uh, who became Boichi, um, and uh, Stephanie uh, Wilson, who was our flight engineer and robotics guru. He became, uh, I'm sorry, she became Robo. And then Paolo Nespoli, who was uh, kind of a jack of all trades, uh, and then also the EVA quarterback. We didn't really have a cool bow name for him, so he became the Italian Stallion, you know, for the uh, um, for the same theme, but. Uh, but in any event, I, I just wanted to, uh, to talk briefly about the solar array repair that we did, uh, which I consider to be among NASA's finest hours. NASA's had so many incredible uh, wins uh, overcoming adversity, but this certainly has to be one of the most extraordinary things that NASA's ever done, in, uh, certainly in the shuttle station era. But uh, as this solar panel was being extended out at the very tip of the space station, this guide wire that had become frayed began to rip apart the panel in a couple of spots. And so the crew actually inside, it was Pambo and our space station commander, Steph, um, um, Peggy, Wilt, Peggy Whitson, excuse me, um, were hawking this very closely. They're, they didn't have the greatest camera views, but they saw that something was wrong. The dynamics were all wrong. They stopped it immediately. And we had a big problem on our hands. You know, we, we have basically a limp noodle out there. And, uh, you know, what do you do? Um, we, we couldn't retract it at that point. We couldn't extend it. And... Uh, we didn't even have really good visibility to what the problem was. And what I love about NASA is, is when the, the chips are at their lowest, they, they regroup, they get their best and brightest together around the table, and they come up with a brilliant plan, and that's exactly what they did. People worked around the clock for 72 hours. I'm sure, sure lots of uh, um, you know, pizza and, uh, and caffeine were involved, but working around the clock developed a, an extraordinary multifaceted approach to get a spacewalker out to the very tip of the space station further than we had ever meant, were ever meant to go, using tools that had never been built before, using a cobbled together robotic system that was never imagined before. And uh, Wheels and myself went out and, uh, and did something that we didn't really know if we were going to be successful at. And, uh, but we, we knew that Dina and uh, Derek Hosman, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, he, who's our uh, lead ISS flight director, he's going to come, but he had a, a conflict at the last minute. But other people like Sarmad Aziz uh, um, and others that I'm going to mention in a second um, were right there looking over our shoulders. And we felt confident that if we didn't fix the problem that day, there would be a plan B or there would be a plan C, and we would get to that as well. But it, it all worked extremely well. And uh, I'm so proud to have been a part of that. And so one of the things I like to do, <clears throat> if you can indulge me, is I, I like to just mention some names of people that um, really contributed to this. Some are well-known names. Many are, have probably never been uttered in public before. Uh, certainly all these people are unsung heroes for this effort, but I, I just wanted to mention them because they've, they've done extraordinary work. First off, uh, I want to mention the late, great Kevin Pear, who uh, passed very shortly after STS-120, but he was kind of the, the godfather of, of the cufflink that uh, was actually the technique that we used to, to repair the, the solar panel. And uh, I had the great good fortune to go to his home right after the mission. I presented him the astronaut's highest award, the Silver Snoopy, along with the whole Solar Ray team and the whole STS-120 team. And uh, it, it was just a great celebration of, of his life and, and uh, it's such a, a great moment um, for all of us to, to share with him. Other members that I, I'm just going to run through their names again, but Derek Hosman, Dina Catella, Sarmad Aziz, Allison Chica Bollinger. Uh, my crew, of course, uh, Pam Melroy, George Zamka, Doug Wheelock, Dan Tani, Stephanie Wilson, Paolo Nespoli, Peggy Whitson. And then we also had Clay Anderson and Yuri Malenchenko, who were basically tending the shop and the rest of the station while all this work was taking place. John Ray, Glenda Laws, Mike Steele, Andrew Clem, Dina Smith, Robert Pickle, Vincent Lacourt, Kauser Intiaz, Dave McCann, Scott Keepers, and then uh, the whole NBL dive team. Uh, I think I see Sherwin Wade right up here in the front, a uh, great friend, um, and many others. Uh, and then we had uh, um, our Capcoms and, and other astronauts that were supporting this effort, Steve Swanson, Kevin Ford, and Joe Tanner. And then finally, the, the VR lab, Dave Homan and Evelyn Morales. So if, if you wouldn't mind, can we just give those guys a, a, a salute? I really appreciate that. 
Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is just kind of reflect on um, probably what I'm most proud of from my NASA years. Uh, and it has nothing to do with that uh, particular mission that I flew. And in fact, it's, it's more about something that had longer reaching uh, benefits to our space program. And uh, um, you, know, you may or may not realize this, but most of an astronaut's time is spent on the ground, unless you're Scott Kelly, of course, and then the, the ratio is flipped. But uh, uh, for me, I spent most of my career, my 17-year career, on the ground working in support of others, other missions, other, other crews, other activities. And so um, actually, I was working with Charlie Precourt at the time. And uh, I think I was deputy of the EVA branch at the time. And he lamented to me at, at this point that we really didn't have enough spacewalking astronauts to build the International Space Station. We had this huge wall of EVA, uh, which basically meant that we had to do dozens and dozens of spacewalks every year, many more than we had ever done over the whole history of the, the, the space program. And uh, he basically just had 12 people who were qualified uh, through the traditional methods of, of getting trained and qualified, which basically consisted of four runs wherein you had to learn the, the skills of spacewalking, and then by the end of it, you needed to demonstrate that you were really good or you were off the list. You were not qualified. And, uh, and so Charlie said to me, hey, we need to fix this. And uh, so I went and I found the cleverest uh, folks uh, that I knew and a, a good friend, uh, um, Zane Ney, from the uh, Mission Operations Directorate. He was an EVA instructor and very, very creative uh, mind. And he and I set out to define exactly what the gold standard of spacewalking performance was. All the things that we do, getting in foot restraints, going in and out of airlocks, operating power tools, the communications, uh, the crew coordination, the many things that go into a very complex spacewalk. And uh, we, we pulled in two other people, Rich Gavreau and Chris Looper. And, uh, and we created this program where the entire office could kind of come back in and say, hey, you know, where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Let's, let's train to those weaknesses. Let's get you up to that gold standard level or to a point where we can qualify you. And I'm so proud to say that, you know, we were able to, to build the International Space Station and I think in, in considerable part because we had the skills program that gave us a, a full complement of very highly qualified spacewalkers. I, I can't even imagine going out on my very first space mission and doing what Doug Wheelock did. You know, the three incredibly difficult, complex, audacious spacewalks uh, with four training runs and, and a, a limited qual. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a real testament um, to, to Doug and uh, to the others who followed in this program to, to, uh, to build this International Space Station, which I think is a real gem. Um, so again, I just wanted to salute uh, uh, some wonderful people and un unsung heroes, Zane, Rich, and Chris. And then finally, uh, I, I wanted to point out that the Astronaut Hall of Fame really has nothing to do with Brian or myself here today, um, or even the space pioneers in front of me. Um, they, the Astronaut Hall of Fame was really created um, by the Merc Mercury 7 astronauts to use their notoriety uh, to help inspire and support financially our, our best and brightest in STEM fields. And, and so I'm so honored and excited to support uh, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation going forward. I think it's a brilliant program. And uh, um, I also wanted to thank the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for arranging this incredible, incredible event. Uh, Tammy and her team are, are, are the best. Um, and so as you leave this place, I just wanted to put in one shameless plug, but uh, please consider uh, opening up your hearts and also your checkbooks and writing a big check to the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation as you leave this place. Um, <laughs> so in closing, I just wanted to uh, congratulate all of the brilliant astronaut scholars who were here today. I wanted to congratulate and apologize to Brian uh, <laughs> uh, for this well-deserved honor. And uh, my thanks to the Astronaut Hall of Fame members who inspired and guided me and also selected me. And uh, my thanks to all of you who have touched my life in, in such profound ways. Thank you. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Congratulations, Scott Parazinski, and welcome to the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. Thank you.
He's another one that said he grew up watching you guys. <laughs> and them too. And them too. And then he called you pioneers, like covered wagons and the... <laughs> the 2016 inductees were selected by a committee of current Hall of Fame astronauts, former NASA officials, historians, and journalists. The process is administered by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. To be eligible, an astronaut must have made his or her first flight at least 17 years before the induction year and must be retired at least five years from NASA, the at NASA Astronaut Corps. Candidates must be a U.S. citizen, NASA trained, commander, pilot, or mission specialist, and must have orbited the Earth at least once and made significant contributions to the study of space. Now, before we let you go, we have a special sneak peek in store for all of you today. We're going to unveil our new inductees displays that will be housed in the new United States Astronaut Hall of Fame later this year. Theron, you up here? Okay. Dan? <clears throat> Did you guys do the honors? Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present to you the United States astronaut, class of 2016, Brian Duffy and Scott Parazinski. And all the members of the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, please join us for a photo. It has been my pleasure to be with you today on behalf of the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this historic ceremony 